The Box of Delights by John Macefield. Chapter 8, Part 2. He took up his box of delights and pressed the knob. A sort of whirlwind plucked him up above the treetops and snatched him south-eastwards to the box tree walk at Sea Kings, where he was set gently upon his feet. He found the other children at breakfast. You're very late, Kay, Maria said. Have you seen the latest? No, he said. What is it? Something like a mystery, Maria said. Here. She unfolded the paper for him. In the middle page were large black headings. Mysterious disappearance. The Mary Dean disappears. Dean of Tachester missing since tea time. Ecclesiastical and other circles have been convulsed at Tachester by the strange disappearance of the well-known Dean from the precincts. It appears that the Dean went out shortly after dark last night in response to what is said to have been an urgent summons and has not yet been heard of. He was first missed at 6pm when he should have attended a meeting connected with cathedral business, but it was not until he failed to return at the deanery for dinner that the family became concerned. At the time of going to press, no news had been received of the reverend gentleman. It is feared at the deanery that he has been a victim of the motor car accident, but we are entitled to our own conviction that the disappearance of the reverend gentleman coming so soon after the recent burglary at the palace and the disappearance of his grace, the bishop, are crimes perpetrated by some local gang. Until a late hour, the cathedral clergy were indefatigable in their search for their friend, who is perhaps the most popular figure in the establishment. Something like a reign of terror exists at this moment throughout Chichester. The police preserve a becoming resonance in the matter and, though they scout the notion that the reverend gentleman has been a victim of a practical joke, they abstain from committing themselves to any definite theory. It is hardly necessary to remind our readers that the Dean of Tachester is a well-known author of possible oriental influences in ancient philosophies, as well as the famous handbook, Cheerfulness, the Christian's Duty. We are sure that we voice the feelings of the rest of the world when we wish that Christmas at the deanery may be gladdened by his speedy return to the bosom of his family. Now, what do you think of that? Maria said. That's the gang that scrubbled me. I believe they've scrubbled Peter, Kay said. And as soon as I've had some breakfast, I'll go around to the police station. I love to see the sleuths at work. Maria said, so I'll come too. They went round and the inspector welcomed them. Come in, Miss Maria and Master Kay, he said. What is it now? More clues for the law to follow? Kay told his story and all his suspicions. Ha, the inspector said. And footprints in the mud, you say? And the roll of blanket in the boat? But you know, Master Kay, you ought to not have gone trespassing at Chester Hills. I was there as a young man and it's a dangerous place. They have a lot of those holes that they call dings, like old mines. Lots of folk break their necks going into them, and I hope your Master Peter hasn't gone and done that. But you are quite wrong, Master Kay, in saying that the principal of the training college is a Mr Brown. It's Father Bottledale, as I told you. I will telephone him now. He telephoned. Is that you, your reference? he asked. I am the inspector of police speaking. I want to ask you if you've seen anything of a lad aged 10 by the name of Peter who was out at your place this morning. You haven't seen him? Hasn't been seen at all? Thank you. And have you with you a gentleman of the name of Abner Brown? No. You don't know the name? You train simply young men for parish and missionary work. Is that so, your reverence? Well, you'll forgive my disturbing you at your good work, but duty is the policeman's watchword, as you will understand, sir. I'm much obliged, I'm sure, sir. Thank you, sir. And I wish the same to you. You see, Master Kay, he said, hanging up the telephone, they know nothing of Master Peter there, but it is my belief about the boys, Master Kay, that leave them alone and they'll come home. 
Kay thanked him and they returned home. Pompous old ass, Maria said. He's a jolly good chap, really, Kay said. He mayn't be a Sherlock Holmes, but he's most awfully good about rabbits. As they went into the little street, more newsboys came rushing from the station, shouting, Special edition of Tatchers the Times! They were shouting, Another disappearance! Special! Cannons of Tatchers to disappear! Special! Murder gang suspected! Special! Bloodhounds on the trail! Special! What clergyman is safe? Special! Another dreadful religious mystery! Special! There you are, Maria said. Kay bought a paper, for which the boy charged him sixpence. He treated the little sheet, which was still wet from the press. Well, we feel that this morning's events are so extraordinary that we are warranted in making them the subject of a special edition of our paper, it read. The night before last, our deservedly popular prelate was torn from us. Last night, the world's dean, as we may call him, similarly disappeared. Early this morning, while they were walking back from the early morning service, Canon Honeytongue and Canon Balmbossom, his friend, were met, we learned, by a messenger who told them that the dean had met with a motor accident, was suffering from a slight concussion and was eager to see them. The reverend gentleman then hurried to the waiting car and, on asking the driver how long they would be, were told, less than an hour. They called to their friends, others of the cathedral clergy who were accompanying them through the close, that they would be back to breakfast. After this, the car of Rolls Royce, according to some, a large Daimler, according to others, drove rapidly away. And that early hour, few people were about and no one seemed to have taken the number of the car. The anxiety of the people of Tatchester may be judged when the breakfast hour passed without any message whatsoever from the missing cannons. Becoming seriously alarmed, Mrs Honeytongue telephoned to the police, who at once instituted a widespread inquiry. So far, we regret to say, without result. Though some people are inclined to believe that our cathedral clergy have been the victims of a practical joke, these events are so strange and follow so closely upon the burglary of the palace that serious people may be excused for having the gravest misgivings. We ask all the inhabitants of the diocese to come forward at once in aiding the police by reporting the movements of all cars likely to have been concerned in the removal of our the red ridden gentleman. The car is reported to have been a large black dark blue, dark brown, or even dark green or grey saloon with a clean-shaven driver in a dark suit. Anyone who may have seen such a car in any of the country roads in the hours between 5 and 7.30 this morning are asked to telephone at once to the Chief of the Tatchester Constabulary. Telephone number, Tatchester 7000. In the meantime, we would convey to all the members of the Cathedral Establishment our heartfelt sympathy with their anxiety. We would also reprehend in the strongest terms all those who venture to criticise the work of our splendid police force. We are sure, what indeed we have never doubted, that they have the matter well in hand, and that it is against the public interest that they should divulge at this, dun at this juncture the point to which their investigations have proceeded. It is an open secret they are in the possession of certain clues which may lead to startling denouncements in the near future. Now, what do you think of that? Maria said. Wait a moment, Kay said. There's some stop press news here at the side. Stop press news. The rumour currently that the missing prelate was seen near Chechester Hills last night's turns out to be without foundation. The gentleman, mistaken for the bishop, was the Reverend Father Bottledale of the Ecclesiastic Training College, who has long been known as the Bishop's Double. Father Bottledale went yesterday afternoon with the clergy's Christmas offerings to the children in the village school of Hope and Chester's, and wearing clerical dress was again mistaken for the prelate. 
No reliable information has reached the authorities about any of the missing dignitaries. Well, what do you think of that? Maria repeated. Well, I know what I think of it, Kay said. They've got the bishop, the dean, the Punch and Judy man, the two canons and Peter in that den of theirs at Chester Hills. Well, if I were you, I'd telephone to the yard, Maria said. It's no good going to your champion rabbit man or whatever he is. Going to the sleuth whose job it is to sleuth. Let's telephone the yard. They telephoned to the yard, who referred them to the chief of Tatchester Constabulary telephone number, Tatchester 7000. When they did this, they were told that the matter would meet with every attention and that, though no news had come about any of the missing gentlemen, they expected developments before the evening. At lunchtime, Kay was called to the telephone. Caroline Louisa's sister wanted to speak about her brother, who was now better. Kay explained to Caroline Louisa, who had not returned from London and had left no word, had neither written nor telegraphed. Well, the sister said, she set off from here two days ago. Whatever can have happened? Kay had a very shrewd suspicion of what had happened. He said, perhaps she's been kidnapped like the cathedral staff. The sister said, that doesn't sound very likely to me, but I telephoned to the hospitals to find out whether anybody has been brought in in the result of an accident. She said that she would telephone later if she heard anything. She did telephone later to report that she could learn nothing of her sister whatsoever. Kay went back to lunch feeling very miserable. After lunch, it came on to rain. There was no news of Peter. It wasn't possible to go playing in the garden. He went upstairs to his room, locked the doors, put caps over the keys as before, climbed under the valance of the dressing table and looked again into the box of delights. This time he looked into an entirely different scene. There was a little hill with a beach club upon it and a vixen playing with her cubs on some tumbled chalk outside a burrow. A badger was padding about. From the glow upon the wood it seemed to Kay to be about sunset on a fine May evening. The cubs rolled around, rolled over and over, playing with themselves or with a bit of rabbit skin and presently Kay was aware that some of the glow upon the trees was due to the presence of multitudes of butterflies of the most brilliant colours. Painted ladies, red admirals, peacocks, purple emperors, chalk blues, commas, tortoise shells, purple and green hair streaks, and besides these there were others. Camberwell beauties and swallowtail and all of these began moving suddenly towards him. He noticed that they were drawing an airy chariot made out of rose leaves from some sweet briar rose. It was like a basket in a chariot, and although it looked very fragile, it was held together with silk. Kay said to himself, Silk is really the strongest of all stuffs, and he stepped into the chariot. At once the butterflies lifted him up, up high over the treetops, going much more swiftly than he would have thought possible, and although their flight wavered now, up now down, it was extraordinarily beautiful. Of course, he said, we are not going to Chester Hills. And very soon they were indeed flying over the very wood from which Peter had disappeared. But inside the wood and all around the great house, as Kay drew near it, there were wolves running and snarling and their hackles up with their teeth gleaming. He never thought it possible that there could be so many. He saw them leaping and snapping trying to reach the butterflies, who kept well out of harm's way. They floated up to the great house, and then around it, though the wolves came out of the chimneys and threw trapdoors on the roofs, and yapped and snarled and showed their teeth. Then, at one little window, as Kay floated past, he saw Caroline Louisa stretching out her hands to him, calling, Help me, Kay! Then instantly two great she-wolves dragged her from the window and pulled down an iron shutter. The butterflies changed the direction and floated away, and away from Chester Hills, and at last brought Kay to a bare mountain, which he had never before seen. In the mountainside there was a little door with a knocker. Kay knocked at the door. Oh, Kay knocked at the knocker, but the little old man opened the door and said, "Will you please to walk in, Master Kay? And what would you like to see, the treasure or the work?" "I'd like to see both, please," Kay said. 
The little old man opened a door, and there was a little furnace with a bellows and an anvil, with little men hard at work making extraordinary things out of metals and precious stones. In cases on the walls were the most marvellous weapons and knives, coats of armour, crowns and jewels, and there were also strange things shaped like hands. And when the little man pressed a button, these hands took hold of hammers or tongs, plucked molten metal from the furnace and beat it into whatever little shape the man ordered. Kay was so delighted with these that he stared and stared and at last one of the pairs of hands plucked a piece of gold, beat it rapidly into the shape of a little rosebud and thrust it, thrust it into Kay's buttonhole. Then the little old man said that it would be time for him to be going and led him to the stone door on the hillside and there was a sort of boat harness to a wild duck. When he got into the boat, the wild duck flew with it high into the air above the dark woods, then down and down and down, till at last the boat was over Seeking's house, and Kay had only had to drop down the chimney, as it seemed, into his room. And there he was, in his room, snapping to the box and putting it back into his pocket. Just as he snapped it... In his pocket, there came a clattering at the door. Kay, Kay, Maria cried. What is it? Kay said. What isn't it? She said. Come down, look at this at once. In the study, she showed him a paper. Look at this, she said. There's a special edition of the paper. They've got the whole of the cathedral staff. No, Kay said. They can't have. They have, though, Maria said. Look here. The special edition was a single sheet, still damp from the press, the big black heading easily smudged. Unparalleled atrocity. More horrors at Tachester. Have the Bolshelkivs begun? A feared terrible plot. Reign of terror in Cathedral City. And there was a note. We had thought that the mystery attached to the disappearance of the imminent clergy of the Tachester establishment would by this time have been cleared up with the return of the bishop, the dean and canons to their functions. We regret to say that our confidence was gravely misplaced. Tonight we have to report the complete disappearance of the presenter, the vesterer, the bursa, the canons minor, the archdeacon, vergers, organist and it is feared other members of the cathedral staff. These gentlemen, according to their custom on the afternoon before Christmas Eve, were proceeding in a motor bus to the Tatterstead Alms Houses, laden with suitable offerings for the old men and women pensioners. They set off, according to custom, at half past three, and it is thought were beguiled into entering a motor bus other than that sent for them. From that moment, no word has been received from any of them. Anyone able to throw the slightest light upon this very dark mystery are adjured to communicate at once with the local police. Telephone touches to 7,000. And spare no pains in bringing the offenders to justice. But what time is this? Kay said. It's nine o'clock, Maria said. We've been wondering where on earth you've been. Oh, Kay said. I suppose I fell asleep. What a very pretty shiny buttonhole you've got, Maria said. What is it? Oh, th that's a little rose, Kay said, looking down. And indeed, there in his buttonhole was a little golden rose that had been made for him in the mountain. I suppose you got it from a cracker, Maria said. But just think of the banging, of their bagging the whole cathedral staff at one swoop. They must have had the brains of buns. You see... They've had warning. The bishop went, the dean went, and the canons went. And then the whole of them go and plunge into a motor bus and are whirled off, very likely, into eternity. Well, I hope they've not been whirled into eternity, Kay said. They were awfully nice to us, some of those clergy. We had a lovely party there the other night. What on earth will they do for the Christmas services? We'll get the news on the wireless. We'd better wait up till then. They waited up until the news on the wireless. They heard that the Archbishop Arch Law They heard that the Archbishops were determined that, in case of need, the services should be held in the cathedral, in spite of the absence of the regular staff, 
and that certain clergy has been asked to proceed to Tachester to officiate there if need arose. The announcer said that the matter was viewed with the greatest seriousness and the public was asked to cooperate with the police by giving instant accurate information of a red, white, blue, grey, brown or black motorbus, the colour being variously given by various observers. Proceeding at a frightening pace in the direction of Tachester some 20 minutes before the alleged outrage. He asked that those who have any information should telephone at once to the Chief of Tachester Constabulary. Telephone number, Tachester 7000. Well, I should think, Maria said, that even the sleuths at Scotland Yard will begin to think they're up against a gang by this time. I should think the gangsters are dropping them, biting postcards. Don't you know my methods, Watson? Etc. However, I should think we'd better get to bed. We've not heard the end of this yet. Some more of them will be gone. You'll see. They've got the whole boiling, Kay said. I don't see how many more they could get. The choir boys aren't there, Mariah said. I think you'll find they've got the choir boys, Kay said. Well, I know who they'll get, Maria said. And those are the clergy who have gone to Tachester to take office in case. Blithering ass as they were. So let the gang know that. I say, Kay said. There'll be a fine old Twitter in Chester. Well, Maria said, if they survive, they'll have gone something to talk of as long as they live. Next to being martyred, I should think having scrobbled would be the greatest joy of a clergyman could have. I should prefer it to being martyred myself, but tastes differ. With that, she went to put some holly in Jemima's bed and then retired to rest.